Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Archaeology Cafe. Um, I am Sarah, if I don't know you already, and I will invite Steve, our CEO, to come and introduce tonight's speaker. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thanks, Steve. Indeed. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and thank you for organizing the Archaeology Cafe series for Archaeology Southwest. I'm Steve Nash, President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, and I'm coming to you from Greater Metropolitan Downtown Reserve, New Mexico, where I've been doing field work for over a decade. And um, I've been touring sites with some of the preservation archaeologists from Archaeology Southwest, including uh, Karen Schollmeyer and Sarah Owis, who is an ethnobotanist, and learning from them as we walk around and examine <clears throat> archaeological sites in this wonderful landscape. Uh, but I am thrilled to be here to introduce you to, to the, the last in our spring series of Archaeology Cafe, uh, by Jesus Garcia, who is a research associate at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. And he's going to be talking about uh, a really cool topic near and dear to Archaeology Southwest's heart um, and near and dear to his heart. Uh, and he's going to give you a lot of his background um, information on how he came to this really incredible work. But tonight's presentation is called Tasting History, a hands-on approach and revival of native and traditional agave crops in the Tucson area. Um, and we were talking before the presentation, I think this is going to be fantastic because it is very, very Tucson based. It's very, very current. It is very, very uh, important work. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jesus Garcia. Thank you so much for being here, Jesus. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And uh, first of all, uh, what a pleasure and what an honor to be a presenter at the Archaeology Cafe for uh, Archaeology Southwest. It, it is uh, so much fun. Uh, of course, uh, there are so many people that we admired in, the, in this organization. And a lot of what we're doing now is essentially uh, all these collaborations over the years. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like to show a little video and then we're gonna dive more into a PowerPoint that would explain more of the details of the project. This little video uh, was actually uh, produced and uh, presented by um, um, Arizona uh, Illustrated, uh, KUAZ, uh, Arizona, um, uh, uh, the local PBS channel here at uh, AZPM. And uh, it is a great little summary of the, uh, basically the project as we've been working over the years and how it's, be, it's evolving and gives you a little bit of a, an excellent view of uh, a visual, let's say, of what we are working on. So great. So now I will share uh, my screen and show you um, a little bit of the project as we uh, have uh, continued working on this uh, agave story. And what this is, is essentially a, a hands-on uh, project. And I always admire uh, uh, what Alan DeNoyer does. Uh, I, I met Alan probably 30 years ago. He was a little skinny kid who came to the Desert Museum and he was already great flint napper. <laughs> this is over 30 years ago, if I recall. And that concept of uh, not only uh, reading or looking at videos about archaeology and discoveries of ancient cultures, but when you start doing something and you start practicing something, uh, I think it's just another way of obviously learning, but also conserving and preserving this uh, wonderful, I guess, legacy that, that we have from the past, from humans in the past, not just in this part of the world, but all around the world. And I think hands-on archaeology is the thing to do. I, I, I really love that. And I think this aspect, um, Alan is really good at making uh, projectiles and, 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 and carbon rock. I decided to, uh, let's get into the plants. Let's work with the plants. Let's see how these plants really taste. Let's see what the plants look like. Let's see how they grow. Let's see how we can make this happen tangibly so we can actually taste it. That is the reason uh, we call this presentation Tasting History because this is a way of um, connecting. This is a way of engaging one's, uh, one person with the history and the archeology span of this wonderful Sonoran Desert. So that's the reason I call it hands-on approach and really reviving this majestic history that we have had uh, uh, over you know, millennia here. So 
First of all, I would like to uh, start with a few remarks and I wanna cover a little more of the mezcal. I know many of you probably already drinking a little mezcal at home, I hope you are. Uh, but just to kind of put into perspective a little bit of the, um, um, the overall picture, because yes, a lot of it is the mezcal craze, the, the concept that is going on around the world right now, but I think this story is way beyond mezcal. And we'll get to that at the end as we move along. But uh, we have a little bit of Spanish lesson right here. So uh, you have this uh, um, very uh, common saying when you travel to, to especially to uh, the state of Oaxaca in Mexico, people say, para todo mal, mezcal, y para todo bien, también. For everything that goes well, you drink mezcal. And for everything that goes bad, as well. Y si no hay remedio, litro y medio. And if there is no remedy, well, a liter and a half. So it, mezcal is, is, is part of the culture. It is not just something to drink over the weekend and get drunk. A mezcal is, is an intrinsic part of, uh, of people's lives, no matter what age and no matter what time of the year and no matter what um, circumstances. So it is almost like a, simply a way of life. So and just to give you a quick uh, uh, example of Mexico, you can get an idea where are the states where most of the agaves are found. Uh, it is, again, uh, it changes over the, um, the studies, but there are over 200, 250 species of agaves throughout the Americas, most of them in Mexico. And when you uh, hear some of the states that have the greatest concentration of them would be Oaxaca, Puebla, you get into the places of Michoacán, Jalisco, into Zacatecas, uh, and then all those states like uh, Hidalgo, uh, Morelos, Tlaxcala, and all the way into Durango, Sinaloa, all the way into Sonora. So we have uh, quite a bit of a uh, uh, array of agaves that when you look at the distribution here, you can kind of see that the western uh, coast of Mexico, the foothills of the Sierra Madre Occidental are where most of the agaves are found. And of course, many of them uh, have been domesticated over uh, millennia. And quite a few, I understand at least 30 or more, are incredibly um, pivot pivotal for, for the culture uh, for, for many, many years. So over the years, um, I'll get a little more about my personal story in just a second, but people like Gary, uh, we're talking probably 25, possibly 30 years ago. Uh, he was one of the first people to try to do an agave roast here at the Desert Museum. And to this day, um, we have dozens, uh, many of our volunteers who, who were volunteers at that time, and they don't forget that experience when uh, Gary actually brought a few, a um, couple of ranches from Sonora, from the town of Cucurpe, uh, people who had done this before. He brought them to the Desert Museum. They went through the process of digging a pit and they roasted some agaves. And it was a sensation. It was a very, very uh, amazing experience that people had. And we haven't had it ever, ever since. Uh, it is very difficult. Logistically, it's complicated. Logistically, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of muscle that you have to dig holes, move rocks, uh, find the agaves. Uh, it, it's a very complicated process. But that was still the inspiration for me to uh, start doing this. And I'm gonna quickly just mention a little bit of a background uh, to get you into the mood of the craze of agave, and then we'll move back into the, the local story. So often when you hear the word mezcal, mezcal really uh, is, is a Nahuatl word that means cooked agave, period. So however it's cooked, typically in, in an earthen oven, in a hole underground, but cooked agave is the, the, the word mezcal comes from. And, Yes, you hear the word mezcal associated with uh, spirits. And in order to be called mezcal, it has to be uh, uh, made out of agave. If it's not made out of agave, any spirits that you could make out of any other fruits, anything that has sugar, uh, it cannot be called mezcal. That's the reason the uh, you know, denomination of origins and all these new words and all these trends in the economic world of, of the mezcal trade 
are very important these days because you hear that a lot, denomination of origin, where the plants come from, what, what region do they come from, et cetera, it has to be mezcal. And then of course, you often uh, make, uh, uh, here's an example one, La Locura, for instance, in Oaxaca, some of those very skinny, long uh, agaves are very unique to that area. Uh, and they're not necessarily round like we know them here. But when you hear, obviously, some of your question, well, what about tequila? Well, uh, we're not going to go into many details, but tequila is essentially a mezcal. So uh, not too long ago, tequila used to be called mezcal tequila. So in other words, yes, uh, tequila is mezcal. It's just the name tequila stuck because it became so popular. They became a... a, 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 a a, a, a unique name around the world and to the point that they dropped the word mezcal and then people just refer to it as tequila. But again, because of the denomination of origin, it had to be from blue agave, agave tequilana, and it has to come from a particular region which covers Jalisco and other uh, regions uh, surrounding the state. Um, you would hear in this part of the world, however, you can hear the word bacanora, and you're going to hear the word lechuguilla. Those are also the local mezcales that you will see at one point was done here in Arizona, but also in Sonora, uh, you will hear those words. Those are the most common. Again, those have to do with the species of agave and also uh, the region where, where they are uh, made. And yes, they are also, many people in Sonora are working into uh, the, the denomination of origin to protect those areas and those uh, um, geographic areas and the species where these particular drinks come from. And there are a few brands uh, that are still around. Some of them come and go. They've changed names. Uh, one of them was Cantiles, Bacanora Tecua. There's a few more. There's at least three or four new ones that I've seen just in the last three or four years. Uh, some of them coming out of Alamo, Sonora. Some of them coming out in the Sierra. Some of them coming out of uh, Chihuahua. And again, uh, people are still, you know, finding a niche in this area. And typically, this is how it's done. It's done in a very simple way. This is, for example, uh, the, the Mezcal Batuca out of Sonora. Uh, many people are getting more sophisticated in their process of, of distilling. In this case, it's copper. Um, often they use uh, stainless steel, et cetera, here. Uh, if you hear the word sotol, uh, sotol is another spirit. Uh, it's actually quite good. Uh, uh, often comes from Chihuahua, uh, Durango, and other states as well. But um, it's not technically mezcal because it's not made out of agave. It's made out of a different plant. It's made out of the salarium, which is a plant that is technically not an agave, therefore cannot be called mezcal. And we're not going to go into details of that, but that's a, that's another topic later on. And also, I like to touch a little bit of the um, conservation aspect, of course, because uh, you hear over the uh, the years, um, people have been making uh, mezcal from wild agaves. And the question is, well, what about the bats? What about the pollinators? And there have been many, many efforts over the years um, to find a compromise. And when you travel into Southern Mexico, especially Jalisco and places in Oaxaca now, you see monoculture of agaves. And whether it's Spadin, uh, the Angustifolia, or the Tequilana, it's going to be monoculture. And there is essentially in this process no room for pollinators because the agaves are harvested before they bloom. Therefore, um, bats don't get to... Uh, even in these humongous plantations with millions of agaves, there's no agaves to bloom. So yes, there is the compromise with pollinators, particularly uh, migratory uh, species like bats. But uh, there's been people like uh, Rodrigo Medellin. It's, it's uh, a person who's been considered, they call it the Batman of Mexico. Uh, he and other researchers from the UNAM, the Universidad Autónoma de Mexico, have been very diligently working uh, with producers to have a compromise and have a certain percentage of um, an agave plantation to bloom, therefore allowing corridors for uh, bats to move around. And apparently that's been successful <clears throat> in some cases, like in this particular case, Tequila Ocho is one that I know. There are probably more now I'm not aware of, but you can actually do some research which agaves have been certified by the UNAM uh, to be bat friendly. So that is uh, some of the compromises. And I know this is a few years old, so I'm, I'm sure new efforts are happening uh, throughout Mexico on this regard. 
A uh, quick uh, uh, kind of background on the distillation process. Of course, we're not going to go into details, but this is the conventional art style alambique that is used when you have a copper still and then you have a, a, a tank with water, often cold water that is circulating for the condensation. And then you have the product coming out uh, when the vapor concentrates um, uh, and it starts uh, dripping. Uh, but uh, there's quite a bit of uh, still debate among some researchers whether uh, agave distillation was happening in the Americas prior to Europeans arriving. It's a fascinating debate. Uh, I think there's some people who argue there was, some people argue there wasn't. But one thing for sure is that there is quite a bit of evidence that um, over about 500 years ago, in 1,200, uh, 12,000 miles in a trade route from the Philippines, there was some influence into spirits and distillation in Mexico through the Philippines. And this process uh, probably came to the western uh, coast of Mexico through the Philippine galleons uh, coming in the late 1500s to Mexico. And some of the process that come from Asia is this clay pot distillation system that is very simple. Very, very simple. Literally, uh, just very little metal is used uh, for the condensation. But other than that, everything else is clay and wood. And uh, again, this Asian distillation is still popular in many places, from Mongolia to China uh, and Southeast Asia. Uh, people um, distilling pineapple juice, mango juice, and all kinds of things, anything with sugar. However, now we have in Oaxaca and other places in Mexico, this clay pot system it is the norm and it, it does have quite a bit of impact in the in the market uh, often people refer to it as ancestral ways of making um, mezcal and yes it is so clay uh, just a small little uh, copper pot is used for the condensation area but other than that is very very simple very very similar to the asian process which is a whole other um, story to to unravel uh, when it comes to the origins of how mezcal became uh, what it is uh, now in Mexico. Uh, here's an example of a, a roasting pit. Look how big it is. This is in Santa Catarina de Minas in Oaxaca. Um, uh, here we have a person standing right in the hole. It's a humongous a pit uh, that it holds several tons of, of agave um, uh, piñas or heads to be roasted. This uh, The process had been taken out already. All that's left is just the uh, um, the fibers and the rocks after he had been um, taken out. But that is several truckloads of agaves that are used in many people shoveling for many hours. And coming back now to Sonora, uh, if you travel to the town of Bacanora, Sonora, that's therefore the name Bacanora, a little town up into the Sierra from Hermosillo is about, I think, two and a half hours or so. Uh, probably three hours near Sawaripa, Sonora, you get to a town called Bacanora. And that's where the name come from. And when the, uh, some of the first producers um, um, uh, distilling uh, Gabe Angustofolia, which I think now it might've changed to Agave Pacifica, I understand, but it's the local, very small uh, piece of Agave from the mountains. And this town uh, has become the town, the recognized town for Bacanora making. And there are, of course, a lot of producers in the area, but this is a monument that represents the local rancheros making agave there. You can see it's all a bronze uh, sculpture there. Somebody uh, manning the, the, the dripping process. Another person is mushing the agaves. And then you see the very um, simple, somewhat crude distillation um, uh, <laughs> materials, which is really what you see right now in this actual picture. It's a 200 little drum, 200 liter drum with uh, sometimes a copper hose, sometimes they would use uh, a piece of a cactus rib to, to channel the, the, the steam from one place to another, and a piece of uh, wood or a piece of palm, and 200 liter drums, uh, basically uh, uh, steel drums. And that's how I've always heard about it. Um, and as I mentioned in the video, my father was a mezcalero in the Rio Sonora, and this is the, the style that I always heard and I always saw. So uh, coming back to Arizona, uh, this uh, not too long ago, Gary and other people uncovered this label out of Arizona right here in Tucson in 1890s. There was a label uh, right here in Tucson called Mezcal Bacanora uh, and it says Legitimo. It's, it is uh, uh, right here produced 
in, in, in Tucson, but apparently it might have been uh, also brought from other places. Who knows uh, what the, 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 the market at that time was. But then, of course, right after that, uh, as you start in the 1930s and the prohibition comes in and things go underground, not only in Arizona, but also in Sonora. And this is some of the species that you will find in Sonora, some of the species of lechuguilla. I've often, a lot of the small agaves, whether it's palmeri, deseri, or any of the other, often people refer to them as lechuguilla. That's the reason the drink is also called lechuguilla. But the most typical one is angustifolia, which is this agave bacanora that in this case you can see is being harvested uh, in the wild uh, from wild species uh, all by hand. And then in recent years, um, many ranchers are starting to uh, cultivate the agave and also in, in a very uh, natural conditions. Uh, in many cases, there's no irrigation. They just plant it with the rains. In central and southern Sonora, rains a lot more than here. So some of these plantations uh, do very well just with a normal um, precipitation. And of course, the process of harvesting them is often by hand. They are cut and, and transported by hand. Uh, in this case, uh, in a donkey like this, uh, uh, as you could see, um, many people here, a uh, friend Bill Steen have been uh, experimenting with agave making for many, many years. A lot of these are his photos that he's traveled throughout the uh, central part of Sonora, where he has able to capture a lot of this very, very traditional way of collecting the agaves and also processing them. And again, uh, they're done in a very small pit uh, where uh, you harvest the agaves and then they are roasted. And it, it's a process that takes a long time. Uh, here's an example when I mentioned uh, earlier in the video that in some cases you use the hood of a truck in a fairly large pit where you put about a truckload of agave uh, heads. But before that, you put a truckload of firewood, a very hard mesquite wood to fire that pit for at least five or six hours before you put the the agaves uh, to be roasted and then covered and then left for another three days before they get out in order to um, process them. So that is part of the very complicated multi-day uh, multi process that most of us simply don't have the time to do that. So over the years, um, uh, coming back more to my personal story here, I would hear stories sitting um, in the kitchen table, hearing my father talk about how when he was young, uh, he was a mezcalero. And uh, the process, the names, unfortunately a lot of the names are not shown here in the picture, but what I was doing, I was just drawing. Whenever my father was talking, I would sit and draw uh, the process that he told me how the agaves were um, found and they were harvested and cleaned and transported in a donkey. Then they would get cooked and then they would mushed and little by little, the entire process. Uh, and it's something that it was in not only me, but also my brothers, it was always in our head. We could hear these stories at all times. So about eight years ago, once the mission garden uh, started to become more of a, a hands-on garden, more of a tasting garden as it is now, uh, uh, I decided, why don't we get together and do this project? It's been in my head all these years. And it sounds, I can do it. I've never done it before. I figure, let's do it. So between my father's um, stories uh, and my brother's, between my travels in Sonora and seeing this process, uh, also, again, getting inspired by Gary Nabhan, getting inspired by uh, Susie and Paul Fish, getting inspired by Wendy Hogson, and people who have been researching not only the recent history uh, of the last few hundred years, but also the history of a thousand of years of agave roasting. I said, well, let's do it. So we dug a hole in the Mission Garden and we started kind of recreating more of a Sonoran style uh, roasting pit. As you can see, it's just rocks. Uh, and, and then uh, they are uh, put together with mud and that's it. And we create a little hole, as you can see the size roughly, uh, not very big. The idea was just to experiment and, and work on it. So in the last eight years, we've done probably 12 to 15 roastings in this little pit. And it's quite handy because as I mentioned, uh, one person or two can manage it fairly easy. The problem was now we have to find the agaves, we have to find the right species, we have to find uh, the agaves of the right ripeness in order to um, 
get the desired amount of sugar that we wanted when they are roasted. So that was part of the learning curve, finding what species of agave we would use. Were they local? Were they from people's yards? Were they from, uh, where could we get mature agaves to experiment? And that's how we started. So we started going around in people's yards. Whenever there was an agave starting to bloom, I would ask him, are you willing to part <laughs> from this agave? And we will bring it to the garden. And in some cases, the agaves were not in the optimum um, condition. They were not either um, ripe enough or they were too ripe or they were past their prime or it was a species that it wasn't probably the appropriate species, but anyway, we did it. We tried it. We put our time into experimenting. More and more uh, people started noticing and they would offer us, oh, I have an agave and it's starting to bloom. Please use it. And I would go to people's yards and collect it and clean up and leave everything nice. And But I would take that agave. And then little by little, year after year, we started narrowing down all those variables, the species of agave, the size, the ripeness, the fire, the wood, the pit, et cetera, to the point that uh, in some cases there would be some ornamental agaves, even here at the Desert Museum. We heard an agave that just started to bolt and it was not appropriate anymore to have it on exhibit for whatever reason. And I talked to the botany department folks and said, okay, I'll take this agave. <laughs> A lot of work, however, to take them out and process them. And then we would get together at the mission garden, fire out the pit. Again, this is a long, elaborate multi-week time collecting, getting the wood, firing it, uh, getting together, drinking some mezcal, and then doing it. So, and then we uh, then put our uh, piñas or the heads or the cabezas inside the pit when it was really, really hot after it's been firing for two or three or four hours, depending on how many um, agaves we had. And then uh, cover them. Uh, again, uh, first times, they wouldn't come out right, it wasn't the right species, uh, they didn't taste good at all, or they didn't get cooked enough, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is how we kept learning year after year. And to the point that we got really good at it, to uh, finding the right amount of wood, firing, it, uh, firing the pit for the right amount of time, and then covering it, and again, one or two people doing the job. So in the process of waiting for the agaves to be cooked, uh, there is another fascinating aspect of agaves that it always intrigued me, which is how people have been using fibers. Again, as I mentioned earlier, agaves, planting agaves, eating agaves is not just about the drink. It's not just about the spirits. It's not just about the alcohol. It's about the tremendous amount of uses that agaves have. The more I travel into central Mexico and southern Mexico, the more you learn how this culture continues to be alive. In Oaxaca, Puebla, Jalisco, um, throughout Mexico, people continue to use agave in many different ways. And fiber, of course, is one of them. And again, learning from my father, uh, often uh, we would do this process by using horse hair. And it turns out that the process of making uh, fibers out of horse hair and turning them into rope and cordage is exactly the same thing uh, doing it with agave, except that you have to process the agave. And that is a whole, a whole new world there. Uh, processing the agave, uh, using certain traditional tools, like in this case is twister, to out of uh, fibers of agave, you turn them into a really unique rope. And this of course becomes a teaching opportunity uh, over the years when we uh, get to teach people how to make rope and cordage out of agave and yucca fibers. So then <laughs> this brings us to the concept of understanding agave as food. And uh, I was talking to Sarah uh, early uh, this week when we were uh, uh, preparing for this presentation. And uh, this is something that always intrigued me as well. Once I started reading and looking at more archeological uh, papers and archeological presentations, the concept of these weird things that I remember reading in one of the exhibits, maybe at Tutsi Good or Mesa Verde, I don't remember, when they first um, found this, uh, scientists didn't really know what they were. They were these little balls of fiber around and, and they named them quids. Uh, in Spanish, they're kind of called masticados, like a masticated you know, balls of, of, of fiber. And this is again, something fascinating that you probably noticed in the video. Can you imagine just right now, I mean, any archaeologist who has found these things over the years is, is, a, is a source of fascination. You know, who did it, how long ago, what species of agave or, or yakas or other things they were using while 
extracting the juice out of these uh, pencas of these leaves, uh, in, uh, roasted leaves in your mouth. And you think it's something from long ago and far away. But as you saw in the video, uh, just a couple of years ago, we had all these modern people making quids. <laughs> we had to tell them, you do not swallow. You have to chew up the, the fibers, uh, soak up the juice and spit it out. And we had all these people making quids. So just this morning, I made my own quids. So this is one of those things that, uh, again, is reviving archaeology, is making archaeology come alive. I think that is the most fascinating part about playing with this um, aspects of uh, agave in ancient foods, you are really living it. You are reliving it. You are uh, experiencing hands-on these things that only, you know, can be found in a cave uh, 1,200 years ago. Somebody did it and you think it's from far away and long ago, but no, we can bring it right here now. So once the agaves are cooked for about uh, two days, uh, in this case, typically we leave it about two days, uh, we uncover, again, one person in about 15, 20 minutes, we take the dirt out, we take the little washing machine cover off, and the agaves are fully roast. And that is a fun thing. Not only to see it, see the process, they're still hot. When you open it, the smell just hits you. It's just this wonderful, sweet smell that hits you almost like molasses. It's, it's just a unique flavor that you cannot find just anywhere. And as you take it out, of course, like I said, it's still hot, then we get to experience it, we get to taste it. And we've done this a number of times at the Mission Garden, uh, some years better than others, but we have experienced these very flavors. And again, bringing back that idea, this is a great rendition of my friend Miguel Molina, uh, uh, possibly, you know, imagine 1200, 1500, 2000 years ago, uh, people going on their business, collecting agaves, uh, making a big deal, a big family reunion, uh, roasting a great number of, of agaves and, you know, having fun, having a big party. Um, another thing that we started in recent years is uh, within the Mission Garden, uh, again, as a conservation uh, idea, but also as a way of reviving these um, different varieties uh, of agaves that uh, are considered anthropogenic species, agaves that have some sort of a relationship with humans over the years. And so we started making these uh, trincheras and these little rock piles, um, agave plantations outside the mission garden, not only to increase our production of agaves so we can cook more as we needed them, but also uh, to use, uh, use them as a conservation, soil conservation project, which is phenomenal. Uh, this is something that has been proven and you can walk around outside the mission garden and you can see a lot of this and we continue to do it every year. So it continues to improve, the number of species continues to increase and we have a greater diversity as well to use. And some of them are being grown in a kind of a nursery style as well, where they do even better when they have uh, good soil and they have irrigation. So this brings us back to our latest project, which is uh, uh, very, very excited about this. Uh, over the years, um, uh, again, what we've done at the Mission Garden, experimenting with different species in small scale here, small scale there, um, uh, little gardens here and there. But recently, um, uh, several organizations, including the Desert Museum, um, the University of Arizona, uh, Local First Arizona out of Phoenix, um, basically, uh, got together to uh, work on this project. Uh, and it's called the Arizona Alliance for Climate Smart Foods. And this is a way of increasing the, or upscaling, let's put it that way, the way of producing our adopted crops in Arizona. So we can maybe shift gears a little bit, not only the concept of mitigating problems of climate change, but also um, lack of water, or also changing the palate uh, for people. Uh, let's say we need to create some sugar uh, product that doesn't have to be sugar cane or doesn't have to be corn syrup, where we can actually produce our own syrups or sugars here in Arizona with local species of agaves that are doing well here. So this was a project that just basically we just started just a couple of months ago. And this is our first planting at the Ag Center at the U of A. And we started basing it on the species that we know they do well here in Tucson. Some of them are the two or three different varieties of Americanas. 
They do extremely well. You probably all have them in your backyard or in your front yard. One of the unique things that this species um, provides is, first of all, they do extremely well, more so with irrigation. Notice at the bottom of this picture here, there's a lot of, lot of babies, a lot of suckers. That is something that we really like because they really clone themselves in, in, in great quantities. And as a matter of fact, uh, we'll, we'll remind you, you can stay in touch if you have agaves that are doing that and you don't know what to do with them, talk to us. We will go and take care of them. We can take all those babies and we can leave your mother plant in your garden and we can take those babies for our project. And whether it's Americana or Murphy eyes or Palmer eyes or, or any of the species that we have local here, but the Americanas are um, a win situation here and we're working on them. Uh, we, some of them are starting at the Mission Garden uh, as a nursery as well. And also of course, right now at the U of A, but it's not just about agaves. This project also covers prickly pear, uh, several varieties of prickly pear, several varieties of legumes, whether it's tepary beans or ironwoods, palo verdes, or other legumes like fava beans. So it's a project that is not just about agaves, it's about succulents and it's about legumes. And we are embarking into this idea of uh, doing something in Tucson that has been done experimentally uh, over the years, but more in a, a way of experimenting and then it gets uh, taken away. We're hoping this project, which we are totally at a different level, uh, will uh, make us, it will last longer and will put us in a different level where this um, um, product that we're getting out of this in grand nurseries are gonna go into farms in, 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 in Arizona. Uh, the idea is to uh, work with Native American farmers who are willing to start shifting or innovating with these type of crops. And it is not easy. It is an uphill battle in many different ways. Um, there's essentially no market for it now, but I think that's the reason organizations like Local First Arizona are working that end. How can we make this palatable to people? How can we make a market out of these pro products and projects so we can actually then cultivate um, these agaves? Now we have irrigation in them, so we're managing that to see how these plants will do, particularly if we have a really bad summer like last year. So we're hoping this will be uh, a way to introduce many other species of agaves. We have about probably about six or seven species of agaves in about probably 15 um, varieties of prickly pear as well. Um, and you can see some examples here and we'll see how that works out. Uh, again, a lot of the projects, um, have also materialized with the Agave Heritage Festivals that we've had over the years. This is more like a city-wide multi-organization um, collaborations where we have now an Agave Heritage Festival every year and people from around Mexico come and visit. So thank you for your attention and I hope you learned something new and I'll be willing to entertain some questions and I hope we have time for that, Sarah, and maybe you can help with that. Yes, thank you so much. That was so fun. I learned a lot <laughs> from your talk and I loved all the images. So um, if anyone has questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box and we will try to get to them. We have about 15 minutes, so we've got plenty of time. So go ahead and put your answers in there or your questions in there and um, we will start um, answering some of these folks' questions. So one of our first questions that came in um, a little while ago was um, they wanted to know your um, your opinion on what is um, the best Bancanora in the Rio Sonora Valley? Oh, wow. Good question. <laughs> uh, well, there are several. Uh, there is one, it's called Tepua. I think it's coming out of Aviacora. Uh, but more and more, uh, you know, uh, you see more of them. Some of them, of course, do not have a label. Uh, tepua, I think you can find it here in Tucson, uh, that's been uh, imported uh, in Tucson. If you go, uh, again, another commercial for Plaza Liquors or um, the Rum Runner, I think if you look in their uh, Bacanora or in their Mezcal sections, you may find at least one or two from Sonora. Tepua is one of them. There is another one uh, that you will not see here in Tucson. Um, it's called uh, the Ochoa family. It's a totally artisanal, totally old fashioned. You need to go there to experience it. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I have a, I have um, a kind of a duo question. Um, someone was asking about the agave plants and if they store water within their structure 
And then I had another question about um, if you mentioned rock mulching and um, I've seen this too around town. Um, I've, I've heard that that's the best way to grow them, but then in your last slides, you had them just in a field. So I wonder if you could talk more about that. Good, yes. Well, that is uh, um, uh, the way, the multiple ways you can grow agaves and starting with um, storing water. Of course, they are succulents. And keep in mind, if you're new to this uh, topic or, 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 or to this um, uh, type of agriculture, agaves are succulents, but they are not cactus. So all cactus are succulent, but not all succulents are cactus. I don't know if that makes sense. But, <laughs> Uh, yes, and they do store water. They're, that's the reason they are a, a C4 plant. It's a plant that um, can stand tremendous uh, uh, drought. I mean, months and months of drought. So these are plants incredibly well adapted to aridity. That is the reason, uh, again, it's a plant that has been domesticated and used over the years in places where uh, basically lack of rain is, is, uh, is, is the norm. And as you go farther south, um, the diversity of these plants increase and some of them are very, very tropical, okay? They have to have a lot of water. But the species that we have up north here are well, well adapted to the rainy seasons that we have. And that is another fascinating way of uh, really working with these plants and working with their cycle, working with their, um, their <laughs> way of life, let's put it that way. So, yes, when uh, we started working with rock piles, it's essentially copying what uh, the fishes have over the years uh, unveil about the archaeology of the region. This is again um, hundreds of hours and years of uh, ar archaeology studies and evidence that we have uh, throughout the region that still there uh, the, during the Hohokam period and 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 going back to uh, uh, over a thousand years. We know that people cultivate agave in a sort of passive way uh, by capturing rainwater and mulching not only retaining the plant itself, retaining erosion, retaining moisture, and allowing for more babies to come up. So a lot of these anthropogenic species uh, over the years have learned that they tend to do a lot of pups. Therefore, the mulching, in this case rocks, help to protect uh, insulating uh, from the sun, remaining more moisture. Therefore, it obviously makes sense. Often, however, that is done in slopes when water, there's some sort of a bajada or runoff and very typical to see it. But in this case, we're embarking into a larger project when we want to produce large quantities of agaves of the same kind of multiple species. I mean, we're hoping not to get into the monoculture side of things. We want to diversify to four, five, six different species if possible, but we are producing as much as possible and we need to do it in a nursery style. So first you start in an actual nursery with whether you start from seed or from little babies or bobules, the ones that grow up in the stock. And then from there, they go into an in-ground nursery into a nice soil where you can still irrigate them, get them to a certain age, two or three years when they are about, a, I don't know, a foot and a half. Then you take them out of there and then you put them in the place where they're going to stay. And if you're going to be producing uh, some sort of a, uh, quantity for the market, well, you have to rely on irrigation. So yet, if you're going to do it out in the field, you may still do some sort of irrigation, but managing it to the point that you don't create a, a plant that is just going to be dependent 100% on irrigation. You're going to manage with within rains and droughts and give them just enough water to keep them alive or enough to produce well and be vigorous and healthy. Hmm. Okay, yes, that makes so much sense. And then as kind of a follow up, and maybe you mentioned this, but um, the new project that you're working on those gardens, are they local located here in Tucson or? Uh, said, can you repeat that again, please? Where the new gardens where you're um, doing this, the, the newer project that you mentioned at the end of your presentation um, with the agave and prickly pear, are those located here in Tucson? Is that? Yes, that uh, that is essentially our first feel to grow mother plants, but also grow some in-ground nursery uh, style to produce as many as possible so we can provide to farmers who are interested in getting to this grant. This grant would actually provide some uh, financial incentive to these farmers to start growing this species. And there's a website, if you go into the uh, Arizona Alliance for Smart um, Climate Smart Crops, uh, you can find that there is a way of applying if you're a farmer, if you have some land 
And yes, this uh, initial project is right here at the U of A, at the Ag Center. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought you said that, but I wanted to clarify. Um, I had a couple questions about, and I think I know the answer, but I'm going to let you um, field it, but about the um, cutting blades necessary to cut the, the agave and um, the hearts. And they're wondering um, it, what types would have been used by the ancestral Odom and if Alan has provided you with any um, of those <laughs> types of yes, cutting of utensils. Course. Yes, I, of course. <laughs> uh, Alan is always experimenting. That is the game when Alan and I come together and we have so much fun because not only uh, you have uh, stone tools, that would have been used for scraping the fibers, which is something that I've experimented with many different things, wood, uh, hardwoods, and also some stones that were made exclusively, of course, and there's tons of archeological evidence, not only here also, but in Mexico, the people were using uh, uh, fl uh, flagstone, other type things to, to scrape the agave. And I'm sure they were using that for cutting, removing the agaves and cutting the leaves as well. And I'm sure they had some sharper tools to do that. And that's where Alan and I come together. And of course, it is so much complicated. And I feel like I've graduated from that. I know it's cool. It is great, but it's not practical <laughs> anymore. So here's when you want to use some metal tools, very, very sharp metal tools. Here's when you start growing greater quantities with a little bit of irrigation, uh, get the agaves to be a little bigger. And then you have a, a pit that is not as, as large and as uh, you know, as simple, you make it a little more complicated so you can have better yield from that process. So we're moving uh, from this traditional knowledge, uh, ancient ways into a more practical, easy to work, higher yield project. So we're moving towards agriculture, but we're not, we're not, we don't want to get to the industrialized monoculture side of it. We're moving, inching away to be sustainable, to be uh, mindful and to be Again, in, in, in conscious with uh, conservation, uh, water usage, water conservation, as well as developing new um, tastes or developing new ways of people uh, to find a, a palette for, for this product. So. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. And, and we have one of um, Alan's tools um, in, the, in our Corona room over here, proudly displayed. So he is always up to something, making some sort of tool, but I understand it's not the most um, efficient um, when you're doing large scale. So I have another question about, you were talking about the variables that go into this whole experiment and the, the rocks and the wood and, um, and how you could, you would get some that were overripe or underripe. And you mentioned when you lift the lid, you could smell the agave. Um, could you tell from the smell if you had a good batch, if you have a good batch or not, or, or do you have to taste test it before you know? Oh, yes, actually, yes. You can actually tell with the smell. Uh, <laughs> it is just, it hits you and it's just sweet. And not only that, but uh, if it's a good batch, as soon as you take them out, they are sticky. Uh, in other words, the sugars are caramelized. Is mm. that agave? Again, we've, we've been doing such a small batches and we've been doing multiple batches. The last batch, we had about four different species and some of them that have never tried before. Some of them, they're not even from here. I mean, we got some of this unusual one that was here at the Desert Museum that is actually from Northeast Mexico. We just happened to have it. It just happened to be blooming and we threw it in there. So we're still in the experimental side of it, but when you do it, 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 which I've seen it in Mexico, in Sonora, when you have the, the same variety, the same size, they were har harvested the right way, they are like incredibly, I mean, the sugar is just sticky and, 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 and you, your hands are all sticky and that's a good batch. And the ultimate goal is sugar. More mm -hmm. sugar, the better. Mm -hmm. Ah, that sounds so good. Um, okay, so we will... Um... We will wrap here shortly. I have a last question, which I don't know um, your what um, your experience with this is, but um, one of our coworkers, John, hello, John, um, is asking about how his plants get an invasion of long-nosed beetles that lay eggs and then um, kill the plant. And he was wondering if there's a way to, pr to protect the plant and, and get rid of those beetles. Yes, that is a well-known... Uh... Uh, pest. They, in Spanish, they call it el picudo. 
Picudo because tiene pico. It's like a, it's basically a weevil. It's a, it's actually a beautiful beetle. <laughs> I love it. It's a, it's a really beautiful looking beetle. Um, and it has this very long nose of proboscis sort of thing. And that's what they call it picudo in Mexico. You can eat the larva. I mean, in many cases in Mexico, it's a delicacy. So that's again, you know, uh, people taking advantage of turning a problem into a solution. However, yes, that can happen. But often, and this is my experience, if the agaves are good and healthy, they do not get invaded by pests. So if you have neglected your agave or you gave it too much water or or, or you didn't water it at all for many, many, many months and it had a period of just like um, having a weakness, that's when the beetles also attack. And if it's a really, really old agave and it hasn't gotten good attention, eventually it will get infested. That's no doubt about it. So that's the reason when it comes to moving from a front yard gardening or a backyard gardening from a few little here and there, and then you want to get into a larger production, you have to watch for all those things. You, you have to watch them every day. You have to pay attention to those things. And it does happen. In some places in Mexico, they simply spray. And yes, you have to watch that and maybe remove them and transplant them and replace them. But also we're hoping to have a multi-cultivation system where you have not only one species all together, they're going to be mixed several species agaves mixed together, not only within agaves, but also within other legumes, like maybe palo verdes, maybe mesquite, maybe ironwood, maybe um, wolfberries, or other species of desert plants. So the idea is to create this agroforestry concept mixed in with agaves, not just create a monoculture like you would see in Jalisco and other places in Mexico. It's not easy. That is the concept that I said. It is not easy. It is a very complicated process, but I think we're on it. We're making a little bit of progress, and I think who knows what's going to happen in the next 10 years. We're hoping um, something will come out of it. Again, the bottom line is also labor. You cannot mechanize it. You cannot do things. So it has to be hand labor, and that is another big, big problem. How can we train people to work with these agaves? It's actually dangerous to work with agaves. They have been incredibly powerful terminal spines that you have to be aware at all times, not only while working with the small plants, but working with older plants. It is a complicated, um, hazardous, somewhat hazardous, but also fascinating way to uh, uh, embrace this. And, and, and we have to learn. We're continuously learning and every day we learn new things. Well, on that note, I want to just say thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we truly, truly appreciated your talk and, and you joining us tonight. And Steve is joining us again here to give our gratitude. And we're thank you for everyone for tuning in tonight. And this was our last cafe of the season. And so we were so grateful for everyone who was involved in this year's cafe. And, and thank you, Jesus Garcia. And Steve, if you'd like to say a few things before we close out tonight. Um, thank you all. Only thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And uh, and that was fantastic. Hey, Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you, Anderson. Good night, everybody. With the Mission Garden, and there's always something going on there. So every year there is an agave uh, festival, and that's the best way to learn. Get on it, taste it, and, and taste a little bit of history. <laughs> exactly. Thank, thank you, you all. all.